This lecture is about outsourcing medical provision. In its narrow focus, it speaks of government paying private sector entities certain, for certain services that it cannot deliver. But more broadly, the focus of the presentation is on the growth and extent of private health care and the increasing reliance of Barbadians on private services. So tonight we are looking at the commercialization of health care. Now, health care provision, especially private health care, has been identified in the works of Elaine Hunt, her book, The Unsung Nightingales, which surveys the development of nursing between 1844 and 2000. Indeed, Ms. Hunt has identified several nurses who've left the public sector to work in private health care. We also have the work of Ray Johnson et al. And their work is all about medical tourism in Barbados, published in 2000. And 12, and looking at the increasing uh, move towards medical tourism. So, we have a number of works on public health care and private health care. But I want to advance the thesis that to explain the rise of private health care we must not just look at the entrepreneurial spirit of medical professionals who've invested heavily in the sector, but I think we ought to look at two other areas. One, rising income levels in the society, particularly after the 1990s, and two, the deficiencies in the public health care system that would have inspired these medical entrepreneurs to set up their own practice and to expand their practice. I want to outline the lecture tonight and I want to divide the lecture into five main components. First, I'm going to briefly look at the extent of public health care provision, starting from about the 1930s. In other words, what do we have? Secondly, I want to trace the extent of private health care provision. Third, I want to analyze the factors responsible for this change. Fourth, I'm going to look at the impact of private health care on the society and economy. And fifth, I'm going to suggest a few points as to the way forward, and these may be um, very controversial indeed. I want, however, before I go any further, to thank Beverly Wood at the UWI Medical Library and her staff. Also to thank the staff at the Sydney Martin Library, the staff at the Public Library, the staff at the Department of Archives. I also want to extend appreciation to our postgraduate students, and I'm talking about Sylvan Payne and Gillian Downs Aline for assisting in the research. 
And last and not least, my family. I have my wife here who um, played a role in going around the community and taking photographs, etc. And my daughter as well. So I want to thank them for coming and um, for assisting and, and, and giving me all the support that I needed to do this type of work. Let us start with the extent of public health care provision, part one. And I want to start with health care for the infants in the 1930s. And the point is well known now that infant mortality in the 1930s was around 300 per thousand in Barbados. And Barbados had the highest infant mortality rate in the British Caribbean. As a matter of fact, in 1935, there were over 275 deaths from malnutrition and a disease deficiency marasmus, over 275. And in response to this very high and alarming rate of malnutrition, one Barbadian assemblyman, Dr. J.W. Hawkins, before the 1929 Sugar Commission, had this to say. He said, well, infant mortality was not a very bad thing. And I want to quote Dr. Hawkins. He said to the commission, and I quote, unless we can have this high infant mortality, we would have a greater population than we could support, assuming that it can support its present population. He continues, he says, if you do not have this high infant mortality, the island would be overpopulated and we would be poorer than is at present. 50%, he says, of those infants die before they are five years old. And with that 50% dying, the island's population is still increased. End of quote. Now, that was in 1929-30, when Hawkins sat before the Sugar Commission. But in 1956, we still have the vexing problem of infant malnutrition in the country. And it troubled one of the visiting medical officers, Dr. Graham Humby, H-U-M-B-Y, Humby. And he was so frustrated at seeing these malnourished children that he placed six of them in a cot and called the advocate. And this was on the front page of the Advocate newspaper, 1956, October 1956. According to Frank Ramsey, who was working with him at the time, and Frank Ramsey's bio autobiography is a wonderful book, it is a must read if you want to understand the problems and the issues that Barbados faced in the 1950s and 60s. It's called A Life of Service. According to Ramsey, Humby told him, we must shock the conscience of the nation. And hence, this um, photograph on the front page of The Advocate was supposed to do that, to shock the nation. But Grantley Adams was not amused. According to Adams, there was not enough room in Barbados for Dr. Humby and me. That's Adams on the political platform, the same here. And he says, I was born here. 
and I do not intend to go anywhere. According to Frank Ramsey, Humby was gone within days. That's what you get when you are critical of Barbadians or critical of politicians um, in this country. But I don't want to go there yet. <laughs> Ramsey, however, argued that in the 1960s and the 70s, although the problem was reduced somewhat, he says he was seeing over 80 patients before noon. 80 children coming to him at the old general hospital before noon. And he also said that in the society, he was ridiculed for his efforts to help these malnourished children with statements such as, why do you bother to save the lives of these little bastards when mothers do not want them? Now, in sum, therefore, what happened to change this position after the 1950s was, of course, the riots of 1937, when Barbadians came out in their numbers and rioted, etc. What also changed it was the recommendations, the wide-ranging recommendations of the Royal Commission, or what we normally call the Moyne Commission, after its chairman, Lord Moyne. The coming of ministerial government as well, with emphasis emphasis on health care. As a matter of fact, when we look at the results after the 1950s, we see several things. For example, we see the construction of the maternity hospital. The maternity hospital at Verona in 1947 at the cost of 115 thousand dollars. Very important to have a maternity hospital where people could come and deliver babies, but not only that, where midwives could be trained as well. Because the object here is to decrease the rate of infant mortality. In addition, in the 1950s, you have the extension of the public health care system. You have clinics first at Spice Town in 1953. They weren't called polyclinics at the time, but we want to call them clinics for now. And more in 1955. And six roads in 1957. And in addition to these clinics, you have outposts throughout the country trying to improve the health care of Barbadians with emphasis on the children. In 1964, the country witnessed the opening of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. As a matter of fact, there was some controversy in the name because some people did not want it to be called Queen Elizabeth Hospital. They thought it was too uh, colonial. But anyhow, we have the QAH. At the time, the pride and joy of Barbadians. And the, 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 um, the, bottom, the bottom image says it all. Here are people on the, the other side of the road. I don't think there were houses there yet. And they're viewing this beautiful institution, now newly constructed, with new operating theaters, a recovery room, pediatric department, at the cost of $8.6 million. $8.6 million. And $3.3 .3 million came from the Colonial Development Welfare Fund. 
1964, therefore, this was the pride and joy of Barbadians because we were moving over from the old general hospital to a new spanking complex. So the hospital is over 50 years. And I say the pride and joy of Barbadians because it is important for us to treasure these institutions. It is important for us to work hard. And I'm talking to the, 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 the medical professionals to work hard and the government to reduce some of the issues and the problems that the, the hospital face at the moment. So by the 1970s, 1980s, you had the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, you had the psychiatric hospital, the eight polyclinics, geriatric hospitals. Then there's the Cecil Graham Development Center, which was called the Children's Development Center, the Nutrition Center, and the public health care system is expanding. Let us turn now our attention to the private health care system. What was happening with private health care? And I want to look at those medical practitioners, nurses, etc., who served in this private health care system. Elaine Hunt in her book tells us that. In the 1920s, nurses from the old general hospital were asked to give service to private individuals in the community at their homes, and the hospitals or the hospital collected the fees. So, from an early stage, therefore, we have nurses whose job, whose remit, was to work at the hospital, but they're given private services elsewhere. In addition, you have the return of Charles, Dr. Charles J.B. Cave in 1908, a U.S. trained doctor. He returned in 1908 and set up what he called the sanatorium at Hastings later moving it to Culloden Road. This clinic specialized in maternity care and long-term care for the elderly. And this has now evolved into Caves Nursing Home on Britain's Hill and Caves Memorial Diagnostic Center opened in 1999. So we have caves, nursing home. In addition to that, there's the Woodside Nursing Home. Woodside Nursing Home, started by Dr. Winston Scott, later Sir Winston, in 1943. And when he started, he offered surgery, obstetrics, psychiatry, and he introduced an X-ray machine in 1951. Today, the name has been changed to Woodside Memorial Clinic. And that was changed after Dr. Scott died, Sir Winston died, in 1976. In 1996, a non-invasive cardiac diagnostic facility was also established with 11 beds at the facility. Then you have Dr. Kerr's nursing home at the present site of the Barbados Workers Union at Harmony Hall. And he offered maternity care, but that closed, that nursing home closed in 1973, and um, that phased out when, in 1973, at that moment. 
In addition, you had the diagnostic clinic started by Dr. Harry Bailey in 1942. 1942. And the story goes that Bailey practiced with Sir Alexander Fleming, who created penicillin. And he returned to Barbados, hoping to go back, but he stayed. He stayed in Barbados. And his story is that he was blocked from borrowing equipment from the general hospital to perform a tracheotomy on a teenage girl. Bailey, it is said, to home the girl and perform the procedure on his kitchen table. And he decided after that to start a small clinic, and he actually had, had 12 beds at his clinic, now the Diagnostic Center. Now the hospital clo services closed in 1970, but we still have general services being offered. We have a medical laboratory, laboratory and the extra services being offered. I now come to the St. Joseph Hospital as another attempt by entrepreneurs to create and expand the private health care system. The St. Joseph Hospital, built at Ashton Hall, was actually a donation of 22 acres from Ashton Hall Plantation. It was designed, built, and operated by an order of nuns called the Sisters of Sorrowful, of the Sorrowful Mother. It opened its doors in 1966, January 6. And here is a, a, a series of photographs. This one, this first one, ta talks about its construction in the early days. And then the other three highlights the dilapidation, the dilapidation that has been allowed to take place at the hospital. Now, this was a hospital that was built at the cost of 2.5 million Barbados dollars back then. 2.5 million dollars. With a capacity of 135 beds. On its opening, it boasted of two oper operating theaters. A maternity unit. A geriatric unit. X-ray facility. An emergency power plant and a 30,000 gallon storage tank. However, after several years of operating, escalating costs and declining revenues put pressure on the, the sisters who were operating it. And it closed in 1986. And some of the doctors who were working there went over to the Bayview Hospital and started what we call now the Bayview Hospital. Now, government bought it three years later at the cost of six million Barbados dollars and refurbished it and it opened again in 1990 with a geriatric unit, a drug a drug rehab center, and of course, maternity care was offered. Now, that was in 1990. When the new government, new Barbados Labor Party government came to office, a report was made saying that the hospital 
ought to be continued, etc. But the government went against the report, closed the hospital in March 1995, saying that it was uneconomical to keep it open. In 1998, Sir Richard Haynes, now deceased, in his commission of inquiry into the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, made the point, and I want to quote Sir Richard, and he said that the physical plan at the St. Joseph Hospital offers opportunities for flexible use on a phase basis to meet the requirements of some of the elderly, to relieve the QEH of some of the problems of overcrowding, and to provide, for the, and to provide a convalescent center for those persons who require extensive rehabilitative therapy. He continues, the commission observed the significant deterioration which has taken place at this plant since its closure and has brought this to the attention of the Ministry of Health. The Haynes Commission recommended that one, urgent steps be taken to halt the deterioration, two, that a committee be established to advise on the integration of the St. Joseph Hospital in the healthcare delivery on the island. As we can see from those photos, the government did not heed the advice and the St. Joseph Hospital was left to rot. And this is what we have now. My view is this, that if we had paid a few people to do limited maintenance work on the hospital, we would have a hospital still in pretty good shape today. And it is a lesson for us as Barbadians that we ought to preserve our buildings, new and old. Because there is this view that after a building is 30, 40 years old, we abandon it and go and build another one. As a matter of fact, in, a couple of years ago, there was a discussion on building a new hospital. Some people were saying that we need a new hospital and that we should move on, etc. But that hospital is only 50 years old. And I cannot imagine a building's life could only be 50 years old. But this is an, a lesson to us about preserving or not preserving our buildings. Now in 2009, this site was leased to the American, a group called the American World Clinics, a group of doctors operating out of America to operate a 74 bed hospital offering private services to foreign persons requiring treatment. 74 bed hospital, but of course, nothing has started yet. We now go to the Bayview Hospital, and I'm, I'm sure that you're tired of looking at these photographs. So let's go to something more spanking, more delicious, Aesthetically pleasing, Bayview Hospital. Four doctors who came over from St. Joseph at its closure started this hospital. Near Beckles Road, St. Michael. It was a 30 bed hospital. Offering surgery offering a range of services, but of course, not all types of care could be done here, and patients have had to be transferred to the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, 
which offers advanced care in several areas. Now at the turn of the century, the drive towards private health care continued with 24-hour clinics, emergency clinics. And I'm talking about FMH, I'm talking about Sandy, Sandy Crest offering these services to the public. In addition, there has been tremendous advancement in cardiac rehabilitation. I've spoken about the Woodside cl Clinic before, but I want to add the Sparman Clinic and the Brace Bridge Medical Center on Belleville. I now come to the first fertility center on Hastings. Established in 2002. A center that has brought hope to many Barbadian couples, but primarily, primarily to couples living overseas who have made use of the center for a range of services, such as intrauterine insemination, ovulation induction, and assisted hatching. So we have a fertility center, and this is important because this speaks to medical tourism, because several of the um, clients who come here come from overseas. Also in 2002, we have the coming to Barbados of the Institute of Regenerative Medicine, 2002, offering a range of services to an international clientele. The evidence suggests that they have marketed unproven stem cell therapies to patients with diabetes, cancer, arthritis. A range of areas were offered at a very high cost. Some people paid as much as 54,000 Barbados dollars to be injected with stem cells. But it closed after 2006 when the BBC investigated, investigated the work that was done at this center and at other centers in the Ukraine. And the people who were operating it made a hasty exit. So if we were to sum up then this private health care, we could say therefore that one, that private health care predates the 1950s. As a matter of fact, doctors were offering services for a very long time. But that this surge to have private health care occurred in the 1990s when pharmacies were expanded, when diagnostic services were expanded. And indeed, we salute these people as entrepreneurs because sometimes they're not recognized as entrepreneurs. They're recognized simply as doctors. But these are individuals who invest, and spend large sums investing. These are individuals who organize uh, nurses and organize healthcare workers to offer a very important service to Barbadians. I now come to the third aspect of the lecture, and we're really winding down. And the third aspect looks at the reasons for increased private healthcare facilities. In other words, how do we explain this? And I want to 
make a few points. First, admittedly, there have been problems with the public health care system. And we cannot escape that. The Haynes Report of 1998 focused on the Accident and Emergency Department. And this is what the Haynes Report said back in 1998. And I quote, the evidence indicates that public dissatisfaction arises from their experience on arrival. The registration, triage, medical record system at the front desk is archaic, unnecessarily prolonged, and indeed unsafe and unacceptable. The nature and persistence of these problems at the front desk are indicative of systemic staff, management, and process problems in the a &E department and the hospital as a whole. That is the Haynes Report of 1998. In addition, a PAHO report of 2009, Pan American Health Organization, listed two other problems. One, the long wait for complex medical procedures. And two, the lack of confidence in the public primary care services. Lack of confidence. Indeed, government has recognized some deficiencies in the healthcare system and has outsourced. For example, there are not enough places at the geriatric hospitals for the elderly. Not enough places. And government has had to outsource to nursery homes, or to nursing homes, not nursery homes, nursing homes. 2009, Minister Donville Ennis said, and I quote Mr. Ennis, every day my ministry receives several calls and letters seeking placement for elderly persons in our geriatric hospitals or nursing homes. However, we have restrictions both in terms of facilities and costs. So the government has recognized their restrictions. I call them deficiencies. As a result, an alternative care for the elderly program has been established. Alternative care for the elderly. So government pays a fee to certain nursing homes to house people who cannot get into the geriatric hospital. In 2009, the cost of this was $6.3 million per year for 232 persons in 36 nursing homes. I repeat that, $6.3 million a year for 232 persons in 36 nursing homes. And that has led to the growth of our nursing homes. As a matter of fact, in 2014, there were 65 nursing homes in Barbados, registered nursing homes. There are some are registered as well. So the point that I'm making here is that government has recognized the deficiency. Government has also started a relationship, according to the PAHO report, with the Heart and Stroke Foundation since 2007 for rehabilitation services. In addition to that, government has ha had to outsource with the dialysis clinics in Barbados. 
because of the rising number of individuals seeking dialysis care. As a matter of fact, the, the, the evidence shows that government spends $1.2 million per year for 24 dialysis patients. Only 24. $1.2 million per year. In addition to that, government has also contracted NGOs. For example, this Teen Challenge that offers rehab services and government pays $105 per day, per day, for 84 days for each individual that goes to Team Hab, sorry, to Team Challenge for rehab. And it speaks to this issue of um, drug addiction and it reminds us that this is a tremendous cost on the healthcare system. And that is why I am very pleased that there are NGOs, there's a lot of debate now about caring for yourself and making sure that you, 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 you care for yourself to avoid this high, tremendous cost on government. But the second point I want to raise in relation to the upsurge in private healthcare has to do with rising income levels since the mid-1990s. The PAHO report of 2008 mentioned or stated that in 1990, the per capita income, the per capita income in Barbados was US $5,000 per capita income. That's 1990. In 2007, it had risen to $10,000. So people are getting uh, more money, people are expanding their horizons, and unions have been asking for more money. We can't do it today, but I'm sure that when we get out of this um, economic mess, we'll be asking for more money as well. In addition, the economy grew at a rate of about 3% between 1993 and 2000. 3%, so you have economic growth and 3.7% between 2002 and 2006. And that economic growth is important because people are earning more and medical professionals are using this economic growth to establish certain centers. But I want to make the point that the economic growth that occurred in that period led to a widening middle class. Widening middle class with certain characteristics. People who live in the heights and the terraces with two and three cars at their home, with, with high paying jobs and mortgages. So there's a more sophisticated type of individual that seeks to avoid the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And there's this perception that the QEH and the polyclinics are places for the poor and elderly. Of course, these people are able to pay at the private centers because of their high salaries and insurance backing. They're also choosing these areas because of privacy. And the argument is that you don't have the type of privacy that is befitting for a middle class person. So these rising income levels, therefore, produce a widening middle class. And that has a role to play in explaining why the provision for private services increased and expanded. I come now to the entrepreneurial drive of the medical professionals. These people who 
were once conservative and would have a small private practice are now changing their habits, now changing their outlook for the good, and establishing various centers. And I want to quote Dr. Frank Ramsey, who made this point very clear in his autobiography. This is how he put it. Many Barbadian doctors, he says, were going to the USA for postgraduate training and returning to influence the materialistic and aggressive attitudes of some of their less conservative and younger colleagues. So these people were going to the States, coming back, and they were doing their thing. We have, for example, Dr. Alfred Sparman offering cardiac care. We have Dr. Juliet Skinner, trained in Ireland, returning to offer fertility services. We also have retired nurses, people who retired from the system, who get together and start nursing homes. And of course, we have foreign doctors who came in and brought stem cell research or stem cell treatment to Barbados. And they have recognized that Barbados not only has an upwardly mobile population, but an aging population. I think that's important to note. Barbados is rated number two only to Japan for the number of centenarians per capita, rated at number two. As a matter of fact, in 2014, only last year, the Governor General made 33 visits, 33 visits to these centenarians. And already, several visits have been made to centenarians. People are living longer, and they demand and this care. I now come to part three of the lecture. What has this had, what impact has this had on the society and the economy? I want to start with the commercialization of Belleville. We have a residential center created at the beginning of the 20th century, which has now been entirely commercialized. And I reflected recently, I was at the dentist in Belleville, and I reflected and to say that I could not walk through that place in 1930, not at night, certainly. But now it is a place where people frequent for their medical care. And what has happened here is that some old buildings have been refurbished and some new buildings have gone up. And, and we have here a few new buildings going up. And Belleville has become that important center because of its proximity to the QEH. So doctors could practice their craft at the QEH and they can also have their private practice in the Belleville area, very close. Belleville also offers parking facilities. So at most of these centers, they are adequate parking facilities that have occurred. So this private health care expansion has really changed Belleville tremendously. It has also brought rising expenditure, rising expenditure on private health care. In other words, 
entrepreneurs are spending money to build buildings like this. And this is the Warren's Health Care Center. And this is in the back of Warren's. So you pass the, the polyclinic and you, you reach. You're not advertising anything, but I just want to indicate where it is. According to a PAHO report, private expenditure on healthcare rose in 2000 from 34% to 37% in 2005. So pe more people are spending money on healthcare. I'm talking about individuals, I'm talking about entrepreneurs. Let's look at it. The Bayview Hospital costs four million dollars back in 1989. The Sparman Clinic, we are told, had a price tag in 2009 of 20 US, 20 million US. Okay, so there's money being pumped into the economy when entrepreneurs establish these centers. And I want to suggest that government give more concessions to encourage people to spend more on health care, to encourage, for example, nurses to set up nursing homes, but have them registered. Now, all of this has opened available opportunities for people, especially young people seeking jobs in the field of uh, medicine and its related areas. In 1995, there were eight social workers. 2000, nine social workers. In 2005, the figure was still nine. My view is that these are opportunities, there are opportunities out there for people to study social work, to be able to be in a position to care for the elderly, to be in a position to care for people who are vulnerable in the society. According to the, 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 the um, report as well, the chief medical officer's report, there were only 10 nutritionists in 2005. Again, this is an opportunity for more nutritionists, people to study the, the field, to offer care in a society that has been plagued with hypertension and diabetes. So there, these are opportunities that are available in this society. Now, the development of these private facilities has also made an impact in relation to medical tourism. We've been talking about medical tourism for a long time. Barbados has the climate, it has the beaches, and we have the peace to encourage individuals to leave the United States, to leave Europe, and to come to Barbados. Certainly, the fertility clinic brought in 260 medical tourists in 2011. 260. The Institute of Regenerative Medicine also brought in a number of tourists. We don't have the exact figure. But what I'm saying is that this is an emerging area in private health care, medical tourism, an area that could reap dividends for all in the society. I want now to conclude by asking the question, where do we go from here? What do we do? 
And I want to suggest five quick points. One, the nation, in my view, people in Barbados then, must now plan for some form of health insurance. Yes, plan for some form of health insurance especially as they're producing children. So when you have your children, make sure, I think we must make sure that there's some form of health insurance because we are not sure what is going to happen down the road. We are not sure how the cost of health care will impact upon us. And as we plan for our students to get into Harrison College and Common Mayor and all sorts of things, we have to plan for, health, for, for um, health insurance for our children and for ourselves as well. Secondly, groups and individuals ought to contribute more to public health care. Heard a person called Brass Sachs the other day and said that she was, she, this person went to the mental hospital and, and the hospital did not have certain uh, basic items that she needed. And I believe that we as a community must get together and the church is a very good organization to do that because churches have a lot of money these days to provide, yes, to provide some level of supplies to our hospital and to our um, ho geriatric hospital as well. But in addition to that, we have to visit these places as a community. We have to visit these places and not to leave the elderly in a, a state of abandonment. And again, churches, health, youth groups can make periodic visits to these persons because I believe that we are beginning to lose patience with our elderly. We celebrate with them when they live to 100 years, but we be, are beginning to think that the elderly is a burden on the society or burden on the family. That is why some families leave them at the hospital, leave them in the a &E. We have to stop that. We have to care for our elderly. Because these are people who have made a contribution to the society. These are people who we want to go on and live very long. So we just cannot let, let them die. And that is why I want to make the point and urge government to continue, and this is my third point, its provision for the vulnerable in the society through polyclinics, nursing homes. This is the St. John Polyclinic that I believe was started in, in the late 1980s. Late 1980s. And these are, there are three shots of the polyclinic and the bottom shot is a society um, in St. John and these are the societies here that depend on the polyclinic. And you know the story of the polyclinic. We don't want to go over that today. But it has been long in coming. Very long in coming. And, and we believe that when it is completed, that it will serve a very useful purpose for the people in the community, especially those over 60. My fourth point, my fourth recommendation, is that government must plan, and the private sector, 
must plan for the increase in persons over 60. Now, this is the projection of the UN population on aging 1950 to 2050. And the projection for 2025 is that 25% of our people will be 60 plus in 2025. So that we are going to have an aging population by 2050. And it is important not to wait until we get there, but to start planning and making preparations for when we get there. Already we can see the trajectory. We can see that people are living longer. We can see that aging has its dynamics. And we, we must get together. I'm talking about the government, the private sector, health professionals, entrepreneurs. How do we meet the dynamics of this situation in 2025 and in 2050? And finally, I think it is time for government again and health care professionals to sit down and deal with some of the problems surfacing at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. In 1964, this was the pride and joy of Barbadians. I still think that it is the pride and joy of Barbadians. There are many people from the Eastern Caribbean who come to QEH for treatment and care. I think that solving these problems is a worthy national objective. It is worthy because healthcare is, in my view, the number one national objective. Without health, you don't have anything. Without health, there's no wealth. Without health, there's no education. And it is important for us to see the QEH as priority in earning out these problems. We must make it once again the pride and joy of all Barbadians. I want to thank you. <laughs>